morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> You're joining us for a discussion of equitable communication, and this is important because we all want to be able to share information, our communities accurately, and we've all seen the results of when things don't get across to everyone in our community, and that includes 50,000 uninsured children in our state. Uh, mistrust of our enrollment programs because they're being politicized. There's a variety of ways that we see the results of when all members of our community aren't getting the information that they need to hear. And our presenters today are experts in this field and will share their strategies and their lived experience in communicating to our increasingly diverse uh, populations in Wisconsin. So I'm very, very pleased to um, introduce our speakers. Mike, I, I can see now that I'm really going to want to see my notes because I wanna do a, a proper introduction of my guests. So if I could have you share my presentation, please. I'm going to stop sharing. Absolutely, let me go ahead and open that up real quick and I will get that shared. Um, so in that case then, uh, whoever is uh, going to be speaking, just let me know when you would like the slides advanced. Yes, I will and... do that. So let me introduce our speakers today. Karen Nelson is the current diversity and inclusion coordinator for the city of Appleton, reporting to Mayor Jake Woodford. She's an expert in leading change and has 30 plus years of experience helping organizations create and deliver diversity, inclusion and equity initiatives. She began her current position with the city of Appleton in 2017 and has led successful communications around Black Lives Matter and reaching diverse populations to promote completion of the 2020 census. Followed by Karen will be Trish Sarvella, who is a member of the Partnership Community Health Center Senior Leadership Team. She's a highly respected leader in health improvement programs, community-based outreach, health literacy and enrollment programs, that reach high risk and vulnerable populations. She's a local state and national leader on a variety of public health initiatives. And then we'll follow up, we'll wrap up with Shemaine Mills, who is an award-winning reporter who has worked in both broadcast and print media. She's worked as a reporter at the Wisconsin State Journal and has also worked as a morning news show producer in television. She has extensive radio news coverage covering Madison City and Dane County governments for several years, and she now mainly reports on health issues. So welcome to my presenters. And Mike, if we can move along to our first speaker, Karen Nelson, I'm so glad you're able to join us today and talk to us about what's happening in our little corner of Northeast Wisconsin in the city of Appleton. And I just want to cue our, our attendees that you have the heart of a navigator and I can't wait to hear more about our work here in Appleton. Karen, you're muted. Thank you, Julia. What a gracious introduction and happy Hispanic Heritage and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. <laughs> I like to point out that it is Hispanic Heritage Month because of the fact that it does not follow a traditional calendar month that goes from September 15th through October 15th. And then of course, Breast Cancer Awareness does follow the calendar month of October. It's my pleasure to be invited to speak with you today during your virtual conference. So thank you again, Julia Garvey, for such a gracious introduction. Next slide, please. So Julia was very uh, impressed with this little, little known fact about Karen Nelson that I am now sharing publicly, I think, for the first time in Appleton. And that is in 2014, I did become a certified navigator in the state of Georgia, uh, with my goal being to reach diverse communities for the ACA in Northwest Georgia through AmeriCorps. So yes, I was an AmeriCorps. Uh, I am an AmeriCorps alum. Um, back in those days, you all will probably remember, for those of you who've been doing this heavy lifting for so long, that was the time when there was much opposition, probably not too much different from today. Uh, and in the, in the state of Georgia in particular, 
uh, one of the additional uh, hurdles that had to be climbed was to secure an actual certified license uh, through the state licensing commissioner for the state of Georgia. Uh, instituted as a deterrent, I was not deterred and actually passed that difficult test the very first time. Uh, and the first one to pass the first time in my AmeriCorps group. While most people thought that I would focus on the urban centers only like the city of Dalton, Georgia, where I lived at the time, I often ventured in my own car, a Burgundy Volvo at the time, uh, into the red clay hills of Georgia, uh, namely the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, beautiful scenery, but full of racism and bigotry. Um, one of the things that I love about uh, my, my, my role there and having this heart of a navigator was that I was so committed to providing uh, equitable communication on the opportunities that ACA offered that uh, I spent a lot of time in rocking chairs on front porches, which will explain the final picture you're looking at in, on the screen. And that is one of the stories that I want to share with you today was actually calling up on the phone, making an appointment with a gentleman who was just at his wits end. It was actually him and his son, um, uh, an older guy. And when I arrived at the mobile home park, I did not know I'd be greeted by a Confederate flag that was actually right behind where you see these uh, plate glass windows. Um, in the um, in the picture that you see here, and this particular conversation was so heartwarming that by the end of our conversation, this Confederate flag supporting gentleman and his son said, "You please tell that president of yours, President Obama, that I am so grateful for the ACA because it's my last resort. If it were not for you explaining to me how I would benefit from this." I'd probably be a dead man in two months. I cried all the way back home to, <laughs> to Dalton. And I share that story because I just want to remind you all of the importance of the work that you do, that there are people out here falling for unfortunate misinformation. And it's up to you and us at that time when I was also on the front lines to simply educate people as to what is best for their own best self-interest. And that's what you do. And that's what I did many, many, many years ago. I bring that same heart into the work that I do today. Next slide. So after more than 25 years as a diversity practitioner, I started this new year, like everyone else did, looking forward with 2020 vision, clarity, and focus. While many people think that diversity is just about race and gender, I'm also here to share with you that diversity is multidimensional, much as you see in this word cloud that's uh, on the slide in front of you. And even this is not an exhaustive list. Beyond that, diversity defined is simply that, a state of being different. Inclusion, though, on the other hand, is more about belonging and engaging. And I'll share with you some opportunities to do that at the end of my presentation. I think that Verna Myers, a diversity practitioner, said, said it best. Diversity is being asked to dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Think about that. As the mother of a beautiful daughter, who's now an attorney, I live that as a mom. And I love sharing this story because I think it really uh, demonstrates the difference between diversity and inclusion. Having earned her way into Rufus King International Baccalaureate High School in Milwaukee at the time, she was so proud of the fact that she was not only beautiful, as you can see, but also brainy, as you now know, because she's now an attorney. But she would, every mom knows this routine. You get up on a Saturday morning with your daughter and they get their hair done, their nails done, they do the makeup. They are all dressed to the nines and ready to go off to the dance. Not 
few just a few hours later, she comes running home, uh, stomps up up two flights of stairs to her room, slams her doors, and she's in tears. Baby girl, what happened? What happened? Mom, nobody ever asked me to dance all night. I like to share that story because it's one metaphoric visual for the difference between diversity, beautiful diverse school, one of the reasons why we moved from Waukesha, where we used to live into Milwaukee, but yet still not inclusion. So think about that as you do your work. Next slide, please. I'm also here to share with you in terms of what's happening today in the city of Appleton, that long before COVID-19, the city of Appleton had been proactive in promoting racial equity. In fact, 2017, the year I started, marked the 20th anniversary of the creation of my position in the mayor's office. In December of 2018, the Appleton Common Council approved a health and all policies ordinance. And in 2019, we joined GARE, the Government Alliance on Racial Equity. In November of that same year, the City of Appleton's Health Department signed on with the Wisconsin Public Health Association. And at the council meeting in December of that same year, four alder persons submitted the resolution that you see here on the screen, where it was referred to, the, to its committee of jurisdiction, the Board of Health. The Board of Health then reviewed it on January 8th of 2020 this year as an information item and voted on at the February 12th Board of Health meeting, the board members recommended for approval by the council. And on February 19th, the Common Council voted for approval with 14 A's, one excused, and of course, one abstain because the mayor does not vote. So you see, first of all, you got to see how the sausage is made, if you will, in terms of creating legislation at the city level. But more importantly, we have decided that in the city of Appleton, we are going to go head on with addressing the fact of race being a health crisis in our city. Next slide, please. In my role as vice chair of Outagamie County Complete Count Committee with Jerry Iverson, who serves as chair, I must remind you that this is a critical month for Census 2020 as well. So as you think about it for yourselves or also with your clients, if you or they have already responded to the census, thank you. But if you or they have not yet completed Census 2020, it's not too late, but time is running out. After a court injunction, the deadline of October 31st has now been restored. As you know, Census Day was April 1st. And then typically a lot of the deadlines that would normally go along our operational plans during the summer would have taken place in May, June, July, August at the latest. But because of COVID-19, we had to focus our priority as a country on the pandemic. And so now after we got closer to October 31st, then the US Census made an announcement uh, toward the end of August, the beginning of September, that they were going to cut it off on September 30th. That then caused a court injunction by a California federal judge to then move it back to the original deadline because it was just uh, inoperative to be able to, uh, to cut it off that quickly without warning. So I just wanted to make you all aware that the October 31st date has been reinstated. It only takes 10 minutes, 10 questions for 10 years of funding for federal and state resources for our community. And also finally on this, the for the first time ever, there are three ways to respond online at www.2020census.gov, as you can see on the slide, or by calling any of the numbers that you see. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately in our case in Wisconsin, uh, the US Census did not provide, uh, let me back up. 
Fortunately, for the first time, the U.S. Census offered 59 languages to reach multiple communities that typically were not communicated to regarding the census. However, unfortunately, one of those languages that is major in the city of Appleton is the Hmong language that was not offered. So we are so proud of the fact that because of our relationship, if you will, with the Hmong American Partnership and other Hmong uh, leaders, that we were able to reach that community through the last number that you see, which is the Hmong Language Assistance Line. So if you still have it, uh, the third option is then you can also mail back your completed form. Next slide, please. From a relationship standpoint, you heard me mention relationship. It's all predicated in the city of Appleton on the Dignity and Respect campaign. Many of you may have already taken the pledge. If you have, again, I say thank you. But if you are unaware, it is an initiative launched in 2018 and led by me in the Maryland, along with my partner in diversity, Dr. Kimberly Bay. Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion and Dean of the Faculty at Lawrence University. We purposefully chose the day after Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday holiday on January 16th of 2018 to kick off the Dignity and Respect campaign as a call to action to come together in our common humanity around the issues of racism, bias, inequity, and in our society. What a great way to live out the values of Dr. King here in Appleton beyond his birthday holiday. And 2019 was year two, where we focused on a deeper dive. Many of you may have participated in many of our truth and reconciliation programs that year, enhancing trust, empathy, and learning, where we actually did land acknowledgments and had our first Indigenous Peoples Day proclaimed uh, in, in place of Columbus Day last year in 2019 and about to do it again next week. And then this, this year, the Dignity and Respect Campaign 3.0 in 2020 is all about GARE, who I've introduced you to with our resolution earlier. Advancing racial equity through GARE, and GARE is an acronym that means the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, a national network of which the city of Appleton is the first, is the first city, is leading the effort throughout the state of Wisconsin, in addition to Madison, Milwaukee, and a few other municipalities. Last slide. So if you haven't already, please take the Dignity and Respect Pledge with the uh, website www.dignityandrespect.org forward slash Appleton. If you haven't already, please like the City of Appleton's Office of Diversity and Inclusion Facebook page. And the minimum, a lot of time here, I did not go into all of the plethora of items you will find there. And you can scroll through for the latest on the local diversity updates and events including our conversations on race that are continuing, including the Census 2020 last push video, and also including the fact that we are offering free COVID-19 tests at our first Black-owned pharmacy, Rx Link, on College Avenue, and much more. From the mayor's page at the next link you see on this slide, from the City of Appleton's website, you can also download and print the Diversity Resources book. It is the 2019 edition. And as of this week, um, last week actually, I've just hired two new virtual diversity interns who will be updating that book as their project for 2020. My office phone number that you see here, no worries, it will still reach me. It is forwarded to me here at home where I have been working since March the 12th or you can email me at either my name or just diversity at appleton.org. And at this time, I will bring my presentation to a close and answer any questions that you may have. Karen, thank you so much. Uh, you've been here a relatively short time in the cities. 
you have been building relationships uh, extensively. I, I, that's one of your great strengths. I've been on calls with you, and I know that your your range of of relationships is huge. You mentioned mun municipalities. Can you tell me are other municipalities engaging in diversity and inclusion discussions? That's an excellent question, Julia. I would love to uh, let you know and your and the viewers know that the city of Appleton is a leader with the League of Municipalities for the state of Wisconsin, having served under Mayor Tim Hanna when he was actually elected president of the League. We have had a multiplicity of opportunities to present to the League of, Muni of Municipalities. And so our range now have covered the fact that uh, many of you may already know that Green Bay has recently uh, approved in their budget for the creation of a position like mine in the Green Bay uh, Municipality. Um, uh, Menominee Falls, uh, not Menominee Falls, excuse me, uh, Manitowoc, excuse me, uh, Mayor Justin Nichols has uh, gone the route of a creating a diversity council. So has Mayor Lori Palmieri in Oshkosh, who's doing the same thing with a community advisory council, and the list goes on. So we are doing our best to share our good news that Tim Hanna, I had the foresight uh, of being proactive, like I said, over 20 years ago. And now, especially in light of today's current events, many of our surrounding municipalities are doing the same. Thank you, Karen. So that, that'll be a good segue into our first poll of our session. Michael, if you could post that whenever you get a moment, and I'll give you a, a second here to answer these two questions and let you reflect on your communities. Okay, well, thank you again, Karen, for sharing. Um, it, it's this community that I've lived in here now for 25 years has changed uh, so much in, in diversity and inclusion. Our, our population has changed and become much more diverse. We have a large refugee population. Uh, I believe that you mentioned that our school age children right now are going to be the most diverse that we've had. So we're really preparing to communicate with our families better about diversity and reach more people. And with that, I'm gonna bring it to Trish Sarvella, who's done so much work to engage our community in these types of discussions. Trish, would you like to take it away? And unmute yourself, please. Can everyone hear me now? Can, Hello? thanks Trish. Wonderful. Um, Karen, it's a pleasure to go after you. Your stories are inspirational and I can see you on that porch with that rocking chair, really trying to figure out how to frame this issue to someone whose ears might be closed to you or to the ACA, but you found a way to connect with him and his son that made it real that made it connectable and made it something that they really moved to action. And I think that story and listening to the work that you've been doing in our community and really beginning to understand diversity and the, the challenges that we have comes to the place where I really want to talk to the group about how do you bring a community together? How do you discuss coverage to care? How do we begin to figure out how we're going to impact the uninsured? And most importantly, where does the conversation begin? And for us, when we began this, and I always have that tune, if I could turn back time in my head, to 2013, when we were getting ready to roll this out and get that the CAC is ready to go, and here we were dealt the hand of the Affordable Care Act and quite frankly didn't know what to do, but we knew that it was important. So our question, as we were looking at Badger Care changing with people coming off of that, those living between 100 and 138% of poverty, and those who didn't even know that they were gonna have an option to ins become insured, those newly eligible Badger Care recipients, 
we were like, where do we begin? And the question that popped up for us as a community health center was one that was very specifically tied to what's going to happen to those people at 101% of poverty to 138 who are going to fall off their badger care and lose their medication access. What will happen when they stroll over to Walgreens or CVS or Walmart and then they're there to pick up their insulin, their ADHD meds for their kids or for anybody and the pharmacist says, I'm sorry, um, your insurance is no longer active. And the person stands and says, but I don't have money to pay for this. What does this mean? And we looked internally, and it all has to begin with data and a little bit of need at our patients at the health center. And for those of you who are familiar with community health centers, our focus is really for people at uh, who are living at or below the federal poverty level. Clearly, we're open to anyone, but our focus population are really people in poverty. And we looked at people who were in mid-treatment plan with dental care, people who suffered with chronic diseases who were at risk of losing their coverage. And that was when we said we need to address this. This isn't our issue as a health center. This isn't just a political issue of Obamacare. This is a community issue. And this is an issue that's bigger and broader than us. And our question was, what are we going to do to help? And where do you call for help in our community and in many communities at the state and national level? The United Way. So off we go to pick up the phone to reach out to the CEO of the United Way, Peter Kelly, and say, Peter, this is a really big issue that's coming and we're not sure what to do about this and how can we get the connect, get our community on board when we know they're very polarized around enrolling into Obamacare at that time and what will happen to these people who will lose their coverage and be outside of care. And the United Way jumped on this. And we said, you know, who else needs to be at the table? And I love this slide, and it's really antiquated, and I, ap I apologize that it's not a live one, but it was our first kind of venue. And, and if anybody's ever done Google Images before, you all recognize that image of those people. Don't look too cro closely because they sort of do look like zombies. After a while, we discontinued using this one. But it was just a quick representative of how could we get the communities shown that the issue was losing your health insurance, but help was available, and we were there to do that. So with the United Way, we were able to pull together our local hospital system, our community foundation, because we recognized that this was not a charge that we could do alone and without some support. Ourselves as community health centers, we brought in the counties, we brought in other people with the idea to one, start with, where do we go with this and how do we one, identify the people who were going to be in need and what were the messages that we were going to need to get out so people would feel that they could enroll, get the coverage and get the care that they needed. Next slide, please. The other piece that we began to think about was who was going to be missed from this conversation. We all know our network of people, the people we're comfortable with that, have, that are at the meetings or used to be at the meetings, and we're part of our social networks of community-based organizations or county groups, but we also knew that the people we really wanted to reach may or may not be coordinated in this way and maybe accessing services in different ways. So this is not necessarily a spiffy slide, but it is one that was our roadmap to figure out how best to engage the community. And, you know, clearly lifted from the Kaiser Family Foundation, but we looked at this, this exact slide actually, and said, if we were to look at the social determinants of health, the stuff that gets in the way for people to engage in care and move forward, what are those areas that we need to look at and who? are those people in our community that are addressing these issues so we could then connect with them. And to us, this was a blueprint. This was marching orders of who we needed to make sure we had at the table and we were engaging in relationship building with. Some of them were natural. Some of them were people who had been connected, whether it's by the United Way or other coalition work, people looking at, at hunger, at literacy, at language, at transportation. But all of these things in many communities, and particularly in ours at the time, lived in their silos. When you're working on one piece, you're working on one piece. And what was the convening ingredient 
to kind of frost this all, this whole cake together. It was about health and it was about accessing care. Because if you look at the economic stability of a community and people's employability or their ability to get out of debt or meet payments with their medical bills, health insurance enrollment is key to that. Improving their abilities to walk and play and stay in housing or engage in education or access food. All of this, as we started to weave our story together, the defining factor in the, the altar call was health insurance enrollment and access to care. So this was a, our ability of a litmus test to neutralize what was very political at the time to what was very much part of who we are as people and who we claim to be as a, as a caring community. Because we know if we were going to look at some of these social determinants of health, we could not avoid looking at the impact that enrollment and coverage to care would have. So as we went through this, this was sort of our checklist, our little Excel spreadsheet of, okay, who's in the employment world? Who's working with displaced workers? Who's actually, you know, working with some of the temp agencies? How do we reach out to those people who are, you know, working under a 90 day job that doesn't have insurance that they could enroll with the marketplace and then pick up employer coverage at 90 days? or people who have lost their employment. How could we work with them? Are there SEP availabilities? Are there people who are being outside of the messages that are there about enrollment? So using this as a blueprint and really a way to, you know, scribble underneath who is the person to connect with and create this groundswell of community organizers, engagers, and, and people that we could bring together to educate. And that's what happened. The United Way helped us convene this. We rolled out a series of, you know, presentations, and there's a slide that I remember so clearly of a white unicorn that we put in there that said, the navigators are coming. And really what that slide was about was it was just like one little unicorn, and, and a little unicorn is fabulous, but a unicorn doesn't get the job done. It was all about how then do we take what we have from the capacity of navigators and CACs and spread that work out into the community so the community could help mobilize those in need of enrollment services. Next slide, please. So as we started to do this, and I think both Karen and Julia's point about the schools is really important because sometimes if we were to all look at our own communities, wherever you're coming from, northern parts of Wisconsin, the inner city of Milwaukee, places, we all have one element that we all share, and that would be our school system. And bringing our schools together around enrollment is a fantastic way to mobilize. And we really approach this with a coverage to care everywhere. The schools were our partners at the very beginning, but quite honestly, it didn't resonate with them initially about how, what that really meant until we started to talk about enrollment as a way of school success, decreasing you know, loss of attendance, truancy, because if kids can get into care and take care of their hearing issue or their ADD or that toothache because they're eligible for Badger care. This is a way to mobilize around not only supporting students and teachers, but families. So as we started to move into this coverage to care everywhere, the Appleton Area School District really saw that this was not just part of, you know, let's hand out a flyer to people and say, you need to enroll, but how best could we really mobilize people where they were at? We hosted early on, uh, you know, pasta and a plan, an event where we served pasta in the cafeteria at a middle school to talk about enrolling people into different plans. How are we able to bring the messages to the teachers who are working with kids who are outside immunization? And maybe it's not because they're anti-vaxxers, maybe it's because they're worried about costs or insurance. And how do you take that message of enrollment and spread it? I love this picture that I have here because Mark from OIC is there and Judy Baseman, our superintendent, and they're sitting in the library of a, one of our lowest income middle schools. And if you could see Mark, he was eating carrots and he had said at the time, please let my wife know that I'm having vegetables while I'm out and about. But what was so important about this day wasn't that we were able to bring together all sorts of high ranking city, state, 
school officials. We were there talking about the impact and change that enrollment has on students and why this is a critical opportunity. And we were able to share stories with Mark and Judy as the superintendent was able to say, there is a direct relationship between enrolling families into school success into improving our community. As we sat there and ate school lunch in little plastic chairs, the discussion was vital and critical because what it said to me was, this just doesn't have to happen in Appleton. This is a strategy that can happen anywhere. These are people that can be engaged with, the schools are ready for this. And now when we look at the challenges that we're facing with virtual school or hybrid models and the stress and the fact that kids are outside of care, how can we be creative and bring enrollment services virtually to them? So this is great stuff. I really felt like between the school lunch being served by the seventh graders who had actually enrolled, and then a principal who spoke about the importance of enrollment for bringing kids back who had suffered from serious mental illness. There was a situation where a child was in a hospital. He couldn't get back to school without being on his meds. The parents couldn't afford the meds. They didn't realize that they were eligible for a special enrollment period. We were able to get them insured and get their child on Badger Care due to the expanded up to 300% of poverty. The child was back in school on Monday. The parents were able to bill back some of the debt and the both parents walked forward with marketplace plans. If that's not community success, not because partnership was there leading the charge, it was there because the schools recognized the need, the family had a need, and we were able to bring everyone together. And when I look at the work of enrollment assisters and this whole movement in the state, this is about mobilizing people together around a community issue. Next slide, please. So as we go forward, how do we message the messengers? Knowing that the diversity is in the community, this is beyond just translation and interpretation. It's really about finding ways to get people connected to the message so it resonates. Back on the rocking, back on the porch with the rocking chair and Karen's example, talking to the schools so it resonates with them, making the message that you send out about open enrollment, about enrolling all year long, is more than just health insurance. It is about the health of the community. Enrollment is always part of creating a healthy community, however it's sliced. We're moving forward as a community with a solutions team now as it relates to COVID-19. And we've really begun to address as a community the challenges that we're having in getting the words out about basic things around COVID. How then can we move from just the COVID message to say, within this, let's talk about people who have lost their jobs or who have lost their coverage, or who have been displaced. How can we blend messages so it becomes relevant to the people who are hearing it and who need to hear it? How do we do this together and make this stronger than we've ever been before? That's really, I think, when we look at equitable communication, it's figuring out the ways to connect understand the lived experience of the community, find out what's going to resonate, and bring that message of enrollment, engagement, coverage to care everywhere you go. I think everyone at this conference believes and breathes this every day that this is not a nine to five. This is really about a way to transform the community and engage people and bring these messages out. It's a work in progress. We don't have it all figured out. But if we can look at ways to mobilize and engage with city government, with schools, with non-traditional groups, with churches, we all know these people, but how do we make that message relevant for them? Last slide, please. So as we go forward, think about how we, you can weave the tapestry of your community. And I really say that in all sincerity, that there's so much out there that we know but then there is so much color and richness that we don't. And how do we bring this all together? So as each one of you look at your community, where you're from, where you work, where you live, who are the resources that you know and how can they be de-siloed, like as we looked at the social determinants of health, and woven together around action and around commitment and care to really bringing those messages of, not only the importance of enrolling into health insurance, but accessing that care that you need. 
last slide, please. And as we move forward in this, and I think the spirit of this year will be challenging. We have a, an election, we have a pandemic, we have the regular challenges of open enrollment and engaging people, but be inspired. We are all together working on this in the state and in the nation. And I really feel connected to what Ted Kennedy said years ago as he was talking about initial health reform and the work that was coming and the, the call to action that we all need to have. The work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. And when I hear those words, those words speak to me about the responsibility we have to having a healthy community and the transformative work of health insurance enrollment and the linkages to coverage and care. Thank you for everything that each one of you is doing. And I wish you the dream inside and that transformation that you can bring back so you too can weave that tapestry of your community together to take action for a healthier community. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Trish. You know, your presentation and Karen's uh, resonates with me about relationship building. And we heard it yesterday from both Aaron and Ramona. Um, Aaron said something yesterday that, that I'm hearing you also say, and really what we're doing in our work is listening to more than just the data, but the voices of the people in our community who are underrepresented and who are possibly missing out on services. Before we move to Shemaine's, uh, Michael, if you could put up the next polling question. And Mike, I'm wondering if you can also give me back the reins because I created a slide for Shemaine that I don't want to miss out on. Um, it, it highlights some of her articles that she's written recently and the, the role of the trusted messenger that she serves in our community. So I see the polling, polling questions up and if you gave me the share, I want you to see here in, in preparation for introducing Shemaine is that she's done so much work to be that trusted messenger around uh, health care and health care disparities. And what I was most interested in hearing from you, Shemaine, although I know you're going to talk a lot of, about a lot of things, is that our perception in the community of what we think is news looks very different to you professionals in the field. So I'm going to drop this um, slide in just a minute here and let you share with us the work that you do, how you serve as a trusted messenger in the state, and, and define for us what is news from your perspective. Glad to do it. Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk about four things, engaging the media, working with different types of media, using storytelling, and the intersection of politics and healthcare. We're all interested in public health, but let's face it, uh, health is not a topic that usually tops the news. Headlines often focus on politics, the economy, education. That's in a normal year. As we all know, this has been anything but a normal year. Healthcare affects those issues I mentioned, so it's getting a lot of attention. It might not otherwise. Healthcare is newsworthy, but what you consider news, the media might consider a public service announcement. That's not to say you can't get your message out. You need to figure out a way to bridge that gap. What public health stories are making news right now? The coronavirus pandemic and the Affordable Care Act lawsuit. Can you find a way to connect your message to those timely topics. How to work with different types of media. Social media, as you probably know, it's a must. Use effectively, it can be extremely helpful. Agencies that deal with crises like fire and police get information out quickly to a widespread audience this way. Make your tweets matter. They have to be interesting and provide useful information. Radio, um, I've been in it a long time, love it. Um, Radio news is short. Our stories are 45 seconds and commercial radio news doesn't exist anymore. That's where I started out. So talk shows are where you can get more airtime, more in-depth discussion about softer news or issues. 
You may also get to field questions from the public, which is very valuable to find out how much people understand your topic. Think about piggybacking on national reporting and suggesting a local angle to a reporter. Follow the journalism on Kaiser Health News, the New York Times, and other outlets that are known for their healthcare coverage and which you know journalists probably are following. Using storytelling. Storytelling adds variety and interest to sometimes complex, difficult topics. Take the finances of rural hospitals. Now there's a story I never thought I would see in a minute 30 television story. That's right, one minute 30 seconds. But it happened and it was effective. Why? They had a patient from a rural area who depended on her local hospital. That's what made it relatable. The economic aspect was essential to the story, but secondary to the viewer. And frankly, most of the public doesn't know what Medicaid reimbursement means. I mean, it's we use the term, but they don't know what it means and they may not care unless it affects them directly. So in that story, the human element was key. And plus editors want a real person for nearly every story. Does someone have a particularly compelling story that pertains to the issue you're trying to convey. Here's a really good example I saw recently. An elderly Dane County man who donated plasma after recovering from COVID-19. To viewers, this was a human interest story. To the hospital that urged the media to cover it, it was a way to encourage the public to donate plasma if they had COVID and had recovered. Can you put it up on social media? Look how a young UW student's bout with coronavirus went viral early in the pandemic. That was some of the best health messaging there was, a warning to others about coronavirus and how dangerous it could be, even to young people. Now, of course, the downside, there was a backlash. If you're gonna be on social media, you need to be prepared for negative as well as positive comments, because trust me, you're gonna get both. And that leads me to my final point, how to depoliticize messaging about healthcare. Well, easier said than done. Nearly every topic today is political, including healthcare. For better or worse, the media tends to cover stories with controversy. I mean, that's why you're seeing a lot of stories about the Affordable Care Act. You can't change the broader narrative, but you can put your message out there. And when you get asked a question that refers to politics, you defer you redirect, you know how to do it. I hope this message was helpful. Hope I gave you some insight on how the news business works. Thanks. Thank you, Shaman. So I, I have some questions to you. And um, I know this is the time that we're getting ready to talk about open enrollment. How do we talk about open enrollment in this politicized climate? And how do we engage our local news media to take an interest in storytelling during this time? Well, when the media first started covering open enrollment, of course, we are we're all looking at the numbers. Are they down? Are they up? Kind of like political coverage, the, the horse race, you know. Now the story is people are losing coverage. They're losing their jobs. I mean, that is the way a lot of people get coverage is through their jobs. So it's a very sensitive issue economically, but if you can find someone who could make use of this enrollment period because they lost their job, I think that is, it hits all the key points I just discussed, the human element, the message of the organization, um, it's not too political. I mean, it's it's economics. It's one of the top issues right now. What distinguishes the messaging around a public service announcement from something that's actually newsworthy? Is it that storytelling or is there some magic here? Well, I wish I could tell you a hard and fast rule, but it's kind of like art. It's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, one news person may look at this and say, this is a story. Another person may look at it and say, no way, no how. So if you can outline, give your pitch in sort of a newsy way, answer the five W's, who, what, when, where, why. 
get up front, up top, why you think this is a story. I get a lot of pitches. I probably get two, 300 emails a day. And I'll tell you, if it's too long or they don't get to the point, I don't even read it. I just don't have time. And I know I'm not alone. So because my boss, he gets four times as many e emails as I do. So get to the point, explain why you think it's newsworthy. This is a story because A, B, and C. What do you think the story is going to be in the next couple of months? With uh, you know, I, what we as and sisters are interested in is maybe different than what consumers want to hear about. What do you think? What do you think Wisconsin wants to hear about in terms of of health insurance and accessing care in this political climate? Well, I have to be honest with you. I didn't think health insurance of the ACA was going to be an issue this year. In fact, when we were planning our election coverage and I was asked to do an ACA piece in June or July, I said, no one's talking about this. And lo and behold, I was wrong. It became the issue once um, Justice Ginsburg died. So evolving events suddenly make something that isn't news news. It can turn on a dime. I wish I could look into my crystal ball and tell you what's going to make news. I think health disparities, there's a lot of talk right now about is the current president getting the kind of health care that other people who may become infected with COVID don't get. So I see that as a potential issue. He has the means, the money, and the wherewithal, the doctors, and he has all the benefits many people don't right now. So that's an example, like I said, latch on to a current issue and I don't wanna say finagle, but try, oh, try and find a way to connect your goals with what's making news. Thank you, Shemaine, it's so valuable. Now I know that we kind of, I, I, I feel like I rushed uh, Karen a little bit. So Karen, I wanna come back to you if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and ask you to talk a little bit about the relationship building that you've done in our community and how our demographic trends have changed and, and how you're going to continue your relationship building. Thank you so much for asking. In fact, it was all predicated on the proactive nature of Tim Hanna's vision back in 1997 with the creation of my position. It was originally termed the intracultural relations coordinator, a mouthful, but the sentiment was exactly the same as what it is today. And how that came to be was actually out of a collaborative relationship between the Appleton Police Department Chief at the time, Rick Myers, and Dr. Tom Scullin, who was the superintendent of Appleton Area School District at that time. And what happened was back in 1975 was actually the first year that the Hmong refugees were received into our country, and many of them settled into the city of Appleton through the generosity of uh, Rotary International, uh, First Congregational Church, and other churches and other and other nonprofit organizations. And 20 years later, now we're, we've gone from you know 75 to 95, and they loved Appleton, and they were still there, and they didn't just come and be rescued from from Thailand and Vietnam during after the Vietnam War and left. At this point, now they're, they, they've homesteaded in Appleton, but still felt very marginalized and not a part of the community. And so that is why I love to use that example of even just the creation of my own position showing both collaboration, but also out of a proactive mode to bring in and welcome in people who are different from the majority. In fact, when Mayor Hanna was first elected in 1996, actually, Appleton was 97% white. So to think just a few months later, when the chief of police came to him with this idea, uh, he was smart though, he didn't go hat in hand, he said, I, I need money for a new position uh, to this newly elected mayor um, by himself. He went with 
with this 50-50 collaborative approach, wherein he felt it was easier, of course, to get the school board to pass 50% of the cost and for a common council to do the same, and it worked. And the reason why that's important is because it showed not only empathy for people who were different from the majority at that time, but, but since that time, Appleton has now grown to, as of the 2010 census, to 85% white. So from 97% to 87 to uh, 85%. And now, even in talking with my current colleagues in Appleton Area Schools, that school district alone is now 65% white. And the reason why that's significant is because those of us who are diversity practitioners, we well know, and many of you may have already heard, that by the decade of 2040, just 20 short years from now, is when America is going to flip from a majority, I mean, to a majority minority country. And it's already happening in many, many pockets of, of our nation. But back home here in Appleton, our school districts are already 65% white. And so we are already trending in that direction. And just think about it, by the time these children who are in second and third grades now and Appleton area schools graduate, do we want to have a community where they're gonna graduate from east, west, or north and say, I'm out of here. This is not a belonging community. Or do we want to have created a community starting right now that will want them to build, to stay and build their careers and raise their families here? Thank you, Karen. I've I've been here for 25 years. I've seen diversity change in our community. I love driving down the street now and seeing a variety of people in our community. And I, I felt, I came from Minneapolis. It felt very, very white when I moved here. And it feels so much more welcoming now. I appreciate your information on that. Well, Trish, I know that you've had a lot of success doing radio interviews and you get a, a, a chance then to broadcast to a, a large audience. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about how you can equitably, equitably communicate through radio talk shows? Sure. Um, radio has been a great piece of the work that I've done with um, the United Way. And by being able to team up with other people's radio time, as for example, a funded United Way program allows us to have that neutrality to come in to talk about something and then also be able to, you know, get in with the, the hosts and prep them a little bit and use some different angles. For example, the United Way will talk about engaging families in care or school success and then that gives us an opportunity to talk about the role of enrollment and coverage to care. So I think if you can find um, local hosts who are doing shows, sometimes the audience isn't the audience you want to reach initially. Um, they might be an older population, but then, you know, if the older people are listening to radio, they have kids, they have grandkids, they talk about this, the issue becomes real. So finding ways to get on with those hosts and team it up with other people has been great. And also doing some fun PSAs. I found that local radio in areas, um, in some of our more rural areas or smaller markets, Christian Family Radio, Country Radio, will always have an opportunity to, to bring in a little angle. I'm mean, doing something like Muzzy in the Morning or talking about um, dental care in Wapaka and other ways to just make something relevant to the host who also can then say, for example, we had one who said, yeah, a couple of my friend's kids have badger care and they don't know where to go to the dentist. Boom, here's the story that we're able to do. So I think figuring out some of the best ways to team up with others and then again, make your message relevant and prep your host. And Shemaine, I'm sure this is something that, you know, you wish you have, you know, not too much information, but enough so you can find personal connections to some of the stories that are there and bring it back around full circle. So um, reach out, AM radio is great, talk radio, even some of the announcers that do things with the local school districts or even church announcers, we've been able to do all sorts of um, publicity that's been on the radio airways or also on YouTube videos or other ways to communicate with people. Thank you, Trish. And Shemaine, I, I would you to address you know, the one of the things that's going on politically right now is the court case of the Affordable Care Act and the 
potential in some in voters minds that it might be struck down and them maybe not understanding that they would continue coverage um, through the ACA uh, in the immediate future after that up to two years. Can you address how you would message around that? And, and you're muted again, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. We probably wouldn't do a story until the court rules. And then we'd immediately, of course, want to do a story on what mm -hmm. happens next? What do people need to know? So that would be something you want to have that pitch ready. So the minute that court decision comes down, you just, you know, send immediate pitches to all the media and say, okay, I think a good story would be people are wondering what happens now. What does this mean for me? It's not just, you know, dissecting the court decision, which of course we'll do. Thank you. And I just want to remind our attendees that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We've only got a few more minutes with our experts here, and we want to make for sure that that your concerns are heard. Uh, Julia, this is Karen Nelson. I did see one question in the chat that was directed to me. I believe someone wanted to wanted me to rename the acronym GARE, and that's Government Alliance on Racial Equity. It is a national alliance. I can also find the website and drop it into the chat for you if you'd like to learn more for your for your municipality. And by the way, Mayor Woodford and I are actually meeting with the League of, of Wisconsin Municipalities this afternoon at two. So we'll be having yet another opportunity to talk about race and equity with all of the municipalities in Northeast Wisconsin. Thank you, Karen. I feel like our community is is representative of what a lot of communities in the state are experiencing in the increase of diversity and and a recognition that equitable communication is important both around health care around policing around um, so many issues right now do you agree most definitely i i i some some days i feel like chief thomas and i are kind of attached at the hip <laughs> and since may the 30th with our first protest in the city of appleton that we are really striving to have that ongoing relationship with our young uh organizers our young protesters and and just making the city available in terms of the resources. Right now, it, we, we're working inside of the constraints of COVID-19, but at the same time, we are responsible, uh, responsible government officials to say, but you always have the right to uh, to protest and uh, and execute your First Amendment rights. We can't tell you not to protest, but we're but at the same time, we, we we do want people to be safe, of course, and wear masks and six feet and all of that. And so as a result of that um, very first protest on May the 30th, literally four days, 72 hours or so, three or four days later, we had our first community conversation led by Chief Thomas uh, talking about uh, community policing and de-escalation, and that began the process for creating his now well-known community advisory council uh, that is that is assisting um, the police department in those efforts. So it's really about having those relationships with people and knock on it, I won't, otherwise my grand dog will start barking underneath my chair. Um, we have not had a single solitary peaceful protest, so-called turn as the media likes to use the term uh, violent. And that is clearly because of, of having those kind of relationships with the young people. And if they get too far along, I can always just pick up the phone and just say, okay, that's enough with the F the police now. Okay, you got it out your system. Let's move on to what are we gonna do to be more productive and, and but, but, but yet also allowing people space and grace to hurt. You know, this this the structural racism is a real thing. And that's why we're tackling it from not not just the individual training. We've done that now for almost 30 years of my of my life now. I'm 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 okay with training. Training has its place, but at the same time, it's time to now move on to policies and procedural changes within our organizations. And that's what we're addressing in the city of Appleton. Thank you, and thank you to all of my panelists today. My takeaway is that uh, living in a community that values equitable communication 
whether your topic is COVID or uh, Black Lives Matter or open enrollment and, and the importance of coverage to care that, that building those relationships in your community and listening to the voices in your community is going to create a pathway to sharing information and being a trusted messenger. So thank you again, and I will turn it back over to Allison and Mike to conclude our session for the day. Thank you all. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. This was really, really great. And I agree. I heard some of the same themes that we we're hearing uh, yesterday and also some new themes, just the importance of relationships, the stories, but also an underlying theme about data. Uh, knowing what's going on in your community, both at a personal level, both what you're witnessing through the partnerships and relationships, both with agencies and the community itself, but also understanding just, you know, at a, at a data level, um, what are the trends? Uh, who's moving in? Who's moving out? Um, you know, no, no big deal to keep on top of all of that, um, but we can do it. I know we can. We, that's why we work together. Um, so I wanted to close out today. Um, so this is the last session of today. We have more sessions tomorrow. Tomorrow is our final day. Um, just a reminder to fill out the evaluation form for last week. We will send out one for this week at the end of this week. Um, and also I wanted to share that for our gift prize, our gift card drawing for today, our winner is Tashonda Hunt. So Tashonda Hunt is our uh, winner and we will send out information to you, Tashonda. So congratulations on that. And um, I think that's all I need to share today. We, a lot of really great information. Thank you again, Julia and panelists. I really appreciate you being here. So valuable. Uh, wish we were in person. We will be again. I know we will soon. No, I'm not going to say that, but. <laughs> Uh, soon enough. And so thank you. Have a great rest of your day. We will see all the attendees uh, virtually again tomorrow. Thank you.